Um, yeah, and just uh, what we wanted to do is just educate parents about the journey of youth sports. Um, I myself, my name is Lakshmi. For those of you who don't know me, I am Niru Jayanti, Dr. Niru Jayanti's wife, but I'm also the founder of uh, Pickup Sports, which is right now it's a mobile app that encourages kids to play pickup sports. Um, it is free to play. We just want our main mission behind it is just to get kids playing for fun again um, and to provide an alternative to organized youth sports. Because um, right now it's kind of like all or nothing. You're either playing organized sports or you got nothing to play, especially as you get to the older ages. So um, we're building this app. app. We're, we're kind of mark focusing our marketing efforts uh, in the Atlanta area, which is where we're based. Um, but then we're, you know, ho obviously hope to grow uh, with this mission of like give kids other opportunities. So with that, um, what, what our plan is for Nero, he's done years and years of research around this uh, topic around youth sports, around injuries. He's gonna gonna just give some high level data points around youth sports and what the research shows. But he really wants to make this conversational. So if you guys have questions, you jump in, ask your questions um, based on what he's talking about. Does that sound good, Nero? Oh, you're muted. Oh, wait, sorry. Yes. There we go. Unmute. Nope. Yeah. Can there you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 We're parents of, of uh, 11, eight year old boys and, and I don't mind unmuting people and, you know, mm -hmm. and, and um, keep it conversational. So, so I'm just going to talk for a few minutes. I'm used to talking from anywhere from five minutes to, um, to two hours, but we're gonna, and the whole thing we wanna keep um, that we're done at, you know, 7.30 Eastern here. So um, when we um, when we talk about youth sports, we wanna know when are children ready to do certain aspects of youth sports and, and where are we with youth athlete development? Where's the current culture? There's actually a big disconnect here. And then what can parents do to give their kids the best chance? And this is actually a monthly thing we're going to do. We obviously, I mean, like I said, there's so much information, so much data, but each time I'm just going to try to package it with either me or an another expert and just try to grow it. And every month we'll hit a different population, but this is kind of a uh, 10,000 foot uh, um, kind of view. And we have our own kids involved. We have a youth sports program. We do quite a bit of research in the area um, to try to help identify where the kids are safe from injury which stimulate a lot of the interest in me kind of speaking around the world on the topic. But now it's more of like being a parent. So, so I'm involved in, in many youth sport organizations around the country, all volunteer. It's just for fun. So mm -hmm. I try to um, do whatever I can to help, uh, um, you know, help improve, you know, that environment because I'm just passionate about it, especially with our own kids there. So, you know, sometimes we give advice and, you know, we have dads who kind of, you know, are thinking about them, like, is this the right thing? It's usually the dads are the problem people. The moms are the ones that are typically like trying to do everything right. And then the dads here, you have to like help convince. And then, then we have like coaches who are like, oh, I don't know about that. That You're not letting them do all the things I want to do. And then there's me. I think I'm like, we can have fun and compete and do everything. We can do elite level stuff, but do it the right way. Um, so, you know, I helped edit a, a, a British Journal of Sports Medicine issue on the young athlete, and there's lots of great data, but one of the most striking things we put in editorial is that we don't want this, where at 13 years old, most kids are quitting. Um, our approach to youth sports should really start with increased physical activity, not start with improved performance. We're reversed in the States. It is theoretically better in Canada, but I know it's like McDonald's, like we, we kind of spread everywhere and we, uh, create some habits that aren't, aren't the best. And, I, I have personally done probably more research on the topic of sports specialization, maybe than anyone um, at this point. And, and I think that's just one aspect of when you only play one sport and that kind of interrupts youth sport participation. And that's where I, my fear is, I, you know, there's an injury risk, but like, we don't like that, you know, a bunch of kids saying, I don't want to do this because of that. Um, so, you know, the first question, and I'll kind of, I'm going to open it up to the group here is when should you introduce your child to sports? So I'm going to leave that out for anyone here and, and, and you can unmute people. And, and I want to hear some thoughts about when you should start youth sports for your child. What age? Dr. J, I'm happy to chime in on this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sorry. Hold on a second. Yes. Um, so hi, guys. My name is Carrie Crocker. I have two girls, um, a 12-year-old and a nine-year-old. Um, 
tennis is, I guess, their quote unquote main sport, but they play, you know, basketball um, as well and soccer as well. Um, just just finishing up soccer. I think they're kind of done with soccer. Um, I was I actually I played Division One basketball. My husband played football, so we we have sports in our blood. My kids actually started it too, just with a mommy and me soccer, and it was just mommy kid, you know, the kid, and just fun running around, and that was the introduction of sports. Don't I think that that was just a fun age, just to have fun. For the next few years, it was just, it's fun and it still is fun. But for us, it might be a little younger, but just sports is in our blood. <laughs> yeah. Any other thoughts here? Uh, Darcy and Tony, you played and what, what age? Um, and I guess in the case of our kids, I don't even think about it. It just sort of happened organically when they were really little. We just play games yep. all the time. Yep. So I don't think about that question specifically i think of it just in general that we yeah. just we just played a lot of games yeah yeah, yeah. and yeah agreed yeah tony uh yeah uh my mom put me in sports at like six and then just tried a whole bunch of different things but i yeah i had to play sports at like a very young age and i think most parents put their kids in sports at a very young age instead of waiting till later well, yeah, and here's the thing, actually. So there's put in sports, and when you introduce your child to sports, what Carrie and Darcy are talking about is exactly what we did. I mean, our kids, I mean, this is like, when should you start? Like these crazy parents getting their kids out there. Like, this is what kitchen at one-year-old or older kid. And why would, oh my gosh, like, yes. <laughs> that crazy totally dad. fine. And we encourage kids to get out there Yay. very young, if you can. And- especially with your parent. I love that. Like we, we encourage it. Our whole model is based on parent-child interactions and so many positive benefits. The first experiences are always good experiences when you're with your parent. So, um, and then most of the time, the intensity increases, not, the parents introduce the child uh, to the sport and then the intensity increases because the coach, it's usually the coach who suggests that you intensify and do more stuff. And, and we'll talk about when that intense period should start but it tends to be the coach. This is UK data, actually, um, from a really great study on elite level athletes. So early childhood is early introduction is, is for sure the best thing. And why? Like, why would you do early introduction? Well, you should introduce and then master skill sets at very young age. You should introduce throwing at one to two years old and kicking at two and jumping and catching, striking and skipping. These are basic motor control sports. At three to six, if you don't have some grasp of these sports by six, and that's sports, these motor control skills, it's a higher likelihood you won't even participate in sport later. So, because you won't have the confidence, the other kids, so, and where does that come from? It comes from, I think, parent-child play in the beginning. That's the number one thing. And so when I hear a Carrie story, and she's being humble because her husband played, you know, Chris played in the NFL, and her daughters are top, top level national rank kids. And they have a very high trajectory, but you know there's a lot of athleticism going on there. So, um, so then the, then the next question: When should I start my child in organized sports, and when should coaches get involved? And that's the question I want to hear from other folks. And um, so, um, and I think we have even a, a couple other people jumped on too. So I'd love to hear what other people think about when organized sports should start with or formal coaching. We have a, we yeah, have Jason, you want to, yeah, yeah. Jason, yeah. So just for context, I don't have kids of my own. And it's interesting to think about all these questions because as an adaptive fitness trainer, there's a big difference with the chronological age and the developmental age. Uh, but uh, with this question about organized sports, and I was going to bring it up in the last slide. So I would say about five something like that. Um, but that's, you know, just an educated guess, mm -hmm. uh, more or less, but you know, that was my question about the, the last slide, like this organized sports. Cause that was my first interpretation of the previous question, but then it's like, exactly. You want to introduce these things before it's an organized competitive, right. like little league situation. Give them confidence. Yeah. Give them yeah. confidence. 100%. And that's where we mistake it a lot. We believe, and this is us 
myself and Lakshmi and pickup sports with our own children is that saying when do your kids start sport doesn't mean when did you sign them up, but when did you introduce sport? And that's all the motor skills. So, um, so organized coaching is a different, this is called sport readiness. When is your kid ready for sport readiness? So we, you know, I was involved with the position statement from our academy and readiness means when you're ready to handle wins and losses as a part of it, all depends on your coach as well too. And how, so yes, that can happen as early as five and six, but some kids aren't even ready for an organized atmosphere till eight, nine. Like the folks on this call have kids who are more in tune with competitive sports but you have to understand, and, and Jason probably works with maybe some that aren't ready for, for any sort of competitive environment yeah. for a year, you know, for years because they don't have the motor skills. So I think we have to individualize that a little bit, but there are some that are, you know, absolutely resilient and they're ready to, you know, compete at four five, six years old. Like we, and this is my 10th, the 10th baseball season for our eight year old. So, mm -hmm. you know, we're not, I mean, we're not making exceptions. They do this and, you know, and try to do something else. So, but, you know, we, we are seeing differences here with when that's being introduced and in, in the intensity that's happening. And so that's, so this isn't, this is fine. This doesn't bother me too much when all these kids are playing like that. I don't like young baseball pitchers. That's my whole separate deal. <laughs> I'm crazy about that. So then middle childhood is what we call that stage. And I think that's the stage where you'll see most kids enter organized sport and coaching as well, too. So this is what we stole from Canada. Darcy's from Canada. And <laughs> This is where we start. We we want an active start where kids are playing. And that usually happens with parents. I think you develop fundamentals, you know, it's like middle childhood, and then you learn how to train and actually get work on the intensity. And then, then you're training to really get better. And then, you know, the long-term strategy is train to compete. Now, I don't mind training in middle adolescence to compete. When I say compete is winning is the outcome that you're worried about. Even in the kind of middle adolescence, it it can be an outcome of great work, but it doesn't have to be the primary outcome. You're still working on trying to just get better. And I think like Darcy's kids and Carrie's kids are in that stage. You, you know, your, your girls are all at national level, which they're doing great and winning is a part of it, but it's still a long trajectory. These are trajectories to play division one college, what you guys are describing probably, and maybe even beyond, but we have a WTA study that looks at that. When do you intensify the, that training? And the ones that we looked at the top 250 players and the ones, and I say this because we have a lot of tennis people on, but the ones that were, um, you know, that intensified at very young ages were no different in their ranking than ones that intensified later. And we, we, we surveyed it. I personally was a principal investigator on the top 250 in the world. And so um, it didn't matter. So I, there's not an advantage or disadvantage. The disadvantage is that you might burn out. You might have a higher rate of burnout for the ones that intensify early. But what we do need to make sure is every kid, and I'm sure your kids are, but we I see a lot of tennis kids, I can tell you a lot of other athletes who can hit a great tennis ball, but they cannot throw a ball probably. They couldn't strike a ball with a baseball. They couldn't underhand. I mean, there's a lot of basic developmental things that we're missing. And so we have to be a little careful about that. So this is going to drive Lakshmi um, because uh, crazy because she's got a graphic design background. But when should my child begin competitive sport and focus on winning? And that's what we kind of just talked about right now. And so it's actually a really loaded question. So when do you think a competition is good for a kid? I'm going to separate that from winning. When is competition good? Yeah, I don't, I, my take on that is pretty general too, is I don't have a problem with competition as long as it's managed in a healthy way from very early ages. It's Okay. I mean, it's like, let's play dice, let's play cards, let's um, run up the hill, you know, let's um, see who can fold clothes faster. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with that. Those are all great examples of using competition in your daily life. And yeah, there's going to be a winner or loser. Nobody, nobody's losing sleep over those things. And I think if you introduce it in those ways really young, then it's not such a it's not so detrimental later on when you're in competitive sports and you start to re feel the the impacts of winning and losing in a more, you know, tangible way. You said exactly. So we'll go back to this model, but but there's actually a really great. Uh, and KP, were you going to say something? I know you just popped your uh, uh, camera on. Yeah, I was. I was going to say um, competition is not bad, but I think that like constructive criticism doesn't need to 
starting to coaching until like the age of like nine or like eight or nine, because you can always tell them how to compete, but they're going to, they're going to mess up from a young ages and they're not going to listen. But by the time they get eight or nine, based on maturity, I think that that's when they really should really care about or start to really um, bring in the competition and really wanting to win. Yeah. Do you have, do you have, are you more coach side or do you have kids or both? I've done both. I've done yeah. both. Exactly. And I've, I've, I've been around coaches who, who don't know how to coach. All they want to do is win. And they started, you know, yelling at kids from three to four to five years old. And I've also been around coaches who know how to actually coach developmental skills like I've, I've done and who try to really, really care about teaching the game, teaching the sport and getting kids excited about playing around and we've we've competed at five and six, but not but not so much that if they lost the game, then it's the end of the world. So you're exactly right. So I, I'm on USJ National Sports Science Committee and we commissioned a research study looking at two thousand junior tennis players. Our kids actually ended up filling out the surveys and there was a fun study. They look at about a hundred characteristics, what what makes tennis fun for them. And among the highest things, one of the highest was competing. And that's why this is really important to say. What you guys are saying is exactly right. Let's let's not pretend that kids don't like to compete and see who's better at something at a very early age. No, in fact, we need to have that. Early competition is actually a, a good thing. Everything we do, every when I and I still teach some of everything I do is like who's gonna get to 30 faster, who's gonna hit 30 balls in a row faster, who's gonna, you know, like it's all of those things. So, but but what Dar what Darcy and KP and others, you know, are saying is exactly right too that focus of the result of it isn't as nearly as important in this in this phase. But the competing is important. And you can't just say, all right, well, just play for fun and lollipops. And it's actually even important for the recreational kid, even if you're not playing. So competition is good. And, and the reality is we've studied junior tennis players for 20 years. And when we looked at ranked versus unranked kids, you have to play more. Like we, this is our Atlanta data. We have data you know, um, looking at Midwest sectional ranked players in, in the Midwest, but it, it never, you know, they, they train earlier, but they play tournaments earlier. They, you know, they start at nine and a half years old versus the unranked kids who start later. So, you know, we know that their, their training volume is higher. So is, is there, there's a risk with that, which is maybe injury and kind of, you know, pulling out, but it's still a healthy thing to compete. So we want to start competition early. So then here's kind of what we get as a million dollar question. When should you intensify your training and kind of quote unquote, go for it? And so that's, um, you know, the, the intensity of the training. And now you have set some goals, like I want to get better. What are, what are some thoughts on that? Should happen when the kid wants to, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> It, yeah, it, it should. And so Lakshmi is right. It should happen when the kid is on it, but some of the kids don't know when that, when that's supposed to happen. And that, so the challenge is like when, so maybe Tony, you played, you know, competitive uh, football, um, you know, really good, you know, really good player was a star running back here at the high school here. But when did you say, I'm going to really, I really want to be a, a really great football player. Uh, you know. Right before middle school. So like about like fifth grade, fourth grade. Mm -hmm. uh, I did not like I realized I did not like losing and I realized that like one way to stop losing is to be better myself and so that's when I wanted things to get like you know a little bit more intense I wanted things to you know uh, get a little bit tougher for me so I could have a better outcome in my games and whatnot yeah okay and then uh, I would add like I wonder what uh, Tony's on your I'm gonna pam him a little bit but about some stuff, but uh, um, Darcy and Carrie have, you know, nationally ranked junior players. So when did, when, or if they have, when did they intensify their training to go for that? Carrie, you wanna go first? Sure, can you guys, okay. Um, that's a hard question. Um, honestly, I feel like for my 12 year old, there's a maturity factor. She's my firstborn, um, so, it took her a lot longer and realistically, realistically, I would say probably within the last six months, realistically, um, I am now seeing a 
you know, now that she's 12, fully 12, she is a lot mature. She is making decisions. She is speaking and communicating with her coaches now. And so that was really important for us. So I would say probably like that 11 and a half, 12, but she is a late bloomer. And I don't know if that's a, you know, 11 or 12 is still real early, but for tennis, it's a different sport. Like it's just a little different. That helps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And we certainly have the tennis data to say that Darcy. Yeah. I, I, like I said, in my last um, answers, everything just sort of happens organically with, with Jacqueline. Um, she's of my three kids, the one that's probably taking the fastest path upwards in competitive sports. The other two are doing their thing too. And they found different levels and different types of sports they want to play. But Jacqueline is the one that is kind of an interesting case study because she's still playing at a, a pretty high level for two sports. And she's 13, almost 14. And almost every single girl her age has already selected out. Mm -hmm. And it's, and Jacqueline is not. And, and we're going to support her until she decides. I mean, we could be a weird story in two years from now where she's like playing national level soccer and tennis. And I don't know how that's going to look. Um, that's one of the reasons I come to these things is because, you know, I can speak pretty openly about how it's been in the past. It's done really well, but I don't know how it's going to be to try to hold on to these two sports for, for much longer when, when there's so much, um, it's not so much pressure. I think it's just the way things roll, like the amount of hours that are expected and, you know, the amount of practices and the amount of driving you have to do in a big city like Vancouver to get across town to a, a soccer practice versus being at the club for tennis, you know, how many, so anyway, that there, I have a lot of things going on in, about that, but yeah. in terms of competition, Jacqueline just organically started competing right after she picked up a racket because we were fortunate to have some really fun local, um, great format tournaments where she was learning tennis. And, um, I mean, just imagine like a mascot showing up with balloons and giving out pizza. That's the style of competition she started in and she loved it. So it was easy. It was mini tennis. It was fun. Everybody wins a prize kind of, you know, more or less. And, and every year from maybe age eight until now, the tournaments get a little more serious, but she still has that fun personality. She's the one that does a magic trick for her opponents in the waiting room <laughs> before they go onto the courts. Like she's, awesome. she's lost some of the, the fun factor of competing, but then she's getting so much like Carrie's kids are, I'm sure is just, she's switching in and switching on more to the fact that she wants to be an elite athlete. And so she has to be able to balance, you know, the fun part of competition versus the get to the business side of it. When she walks on the court, it's business and I'm, I'm, I'm there to try to win. So. Yeah, that's awesome. And I'm going to actually just go over, I'm going to, I'm going to go over the next question because this is the data on it. And this is when should you quit other sports to focus on one sport? And that kind of goes into one. So, well, I'll tell you one before I even put this slide. I'm up. sorry. Can I, can I jump oh, in yeah, and ask please. a question? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, how do you define intensified training? Like, for example, if um, I have a kid uh, um, 12 years old, mm -hmm. how many hours a week do you define it as intensified training? That's Thank a you. great, it's a, yeah, it's a great question. And I think one of the ways it just define it could be that you're only playing one sport and that's, that's what we call sports specialization. Um, and the other way to describe it is that you have um, focused on only getting better and your training and intensity is most days of the week, you're training to compete and win. And I think that's the intent that, that your, your results are important and and so they cross over some, but what Darcy alluded to is, and so, you know, we have data that you should train less hours per week than your age. And that's, you know, there's some risk behind that, but it has to be in the developmental stage. So when you're middle adolescence and later is typically when we say intensity is in the girls, that's a little later, right? And we're going to go over future things about all the details of what happens through each developmental phase. This phase right here is when you specialize in sport and choose it. There's two girls, Ingrid Neal and Jessica Aini. Now it's been about 15 years or so. They they were in Minnesota. They were top level tennis players and hockey players. Mm -hmm. uh, both of them end up playing professional tennis. 
and um, they and I knew them and still do know them very well. Great, great kids, great athletes, and they just didn't want to stop the other sport, and they were didn't affect their outcomes. They were great, and so I would not change anything for for your daughter. So, um, mm -hmm. I'm gonna actually leave it at that because this is probably and I, and we have a whole session we're gonna talk about just this in the future with specialization. We want to be respectful of, of, of time and everything like that. We're gonna go over things in the future in, in really great detail, but is there any other questions that people have? Um, Cause I can literally talk about this for days and Lakshmi can talk about <laughs> all the, all the efforts. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it seems like, I, I guess what I'm hearing is that, that maybe the next topic should be around specialization um, and and training and and like how much is enough for, um, for as far as intensity is concerned, it seems like that the questions are leaning around that. Does, does that sound right? Yeah, and and uh, and you guys right now, it's funny is because sometimes the people who get onto these things are doing the most of the right things too. <laughs> <laughs> but yes. we still have data to support it. Sometimes you need to be empowered because I've noticed when the top players are doing the right things, other people follow. And that's where it's been helpful. I'd be, I'd be really interested in, in a, you know, a 30 minute or 45 minute, whatever you want on uh, specialization. I think it's a great topic. I'd love to ask questions. It's like a deeper dive into that. Yeah. yeah. Deeper dive into that. I mean, that case study that you're talking about, if you could present that a little bit more, like tell us your, from your, you know, your medical side and your coaching yeah. side, side, like give us your insights about yeah. how those yeah. girls do that. And then yeah, I mean, I that's one of the things that I'm looking for is inspiration to say, look, you know, statistically, at least I'm in a one little bubble inside of Canada, but statistically, girls are not um, sticking with two high level sports. They'll go to sport A, sport B. They'll play a little high school basketball. They'll do, you know, volleyball for a season and then they'll have like tennis or, or something else as a yeah. primer. But that's not the same as is truly trying to be a, like a high performance athlete in two sports. 20, you know, 24 seven. And that's where I would love to hear more inspirational yeah. stories and also maybe some warnings, you know, how do you watch for signs of burnout? How do you watch for signs of, you know, how do you do prehab best? How yeah. do you to coaches and yeah. uh, help, you know, because the parent ends up being in the middle of those things, the yeah. two parents, the two coaches, the two sports don't collaborate. They don't yeah. speak to each other. It's up to the parents, you know, to be in the middle of that conversation and, and to help their child through it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. You are spot on all that. I'm going to leave you with one, only one data point. Um, and then we absolutely have, this is what I speak on most commonly, all those little dots where I've spoken around different parts of the world on this exact topic, but mm -hmm. the age of specialization for junior tennis players, which is 10.4 years old, was the same as, as it is in WTA players. It's really fascinating. Co two completely different studies that, that, that I was, that I was involved in, but yet, come to the same data point. And wait, so, wait, repeat that again. The age of specialization in what? In, in junior tennis players, high performance juniors. These are sexual okay. kids was mm -hmm. the same as it was in WTA players in two separate okay. studies. Okay. So it's about 10 and a half years old. Mm -hmm. That's and so young. So, yeah. And that's just the culture. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. That's the current culture. And our data that we just did in Atlanta is, is all kind of fits the same thing as when they decide so, but that doesn't mean that's the only path. We've certainly learned that it's not the only path, but but I have lots of data and that we'll definitely take a deep dive on that. Anyone else have a last question? Because we do, one thing about this is we wanna, when we do these things, we wanna make sure that we're staying on our, our time targets and then, um, and seeing what works for our, our people who are gonna jump on. Cause we're gonna grow this. We're gonna keep doing this. And, you know, I think we're gonna get, you know, parents who are interested, coaches and stuff. Anyone else? Well, I don't know if this would be appropriate to get into today, but oh. I I find it so interesting learning so much about sports and what's going on culturally, you know, because what I'm I'm coming at it from a different angle where I also I look to, you know, reinvent youth fitness almost mm -hmm. by creating a almost like a new type of sport, you know, based on movement and like fitness training, you know, working out like as a personal trainer. So I'd be interested in, you know, maybe even comparing 
the fitness fitness results that come from sports versus fitness training that's not a sport you yeah, know yeah. like working out you know learning like yeah. movement skills lunges throwing medicine balls yeah. you know Weight that training. kind of thing versus yeah, yeah. you know tennis soccer basketball football yeah so and free play. another day I don't know. one of the things we want yeah one of the things we want to talk about is, is free play actually it's not being necessarily being coached in a sport but just actually having the child develop those on their own too. But yeah, you know, that's good. We'll, we'll keep, we're going to keep notes of all this and we're going to keep this up. We're going to do this throughout the year. We have uh, a, a really ambitious goal to just reach as many parents as coaches as we kind of just done so many talks and Lakshmi has done so much work and as a CEO and a mom of just trying to help uh, parents. So this is so helpful for us too. So thank you all for joining. And then, um, She'll send an yeah. email and record this as well, Lex. I, I am recording this and I, and I see that some people have joined that maybe didn't register, which is totally fine. I just want to make sure you hear about, you know, our featured, um, you know, chats and um, just hear about it. So I, I did pop my email address in the chat here. So if you didn't register through Eventbrite and you're not on our list and you want to hear about future stuff, just shoot me an email and I'll, and I'll add you. Um, but we are planning to do more of these. We'll, we'll do a variety of topics. We'll even try at different times. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know if lunch during the week, like a lunch and learn would work better. Um, so you can just let me know what, what works for you and that'd be helpful. Yeah. Sure. sure. Yeah. Thank you so much, you guys. That was really brilliant. This was awesome, guys. Thank you again. Thank yeah. you. We'll do more. Right. Yeah, we'll do more. Thank you guys all. Thank you all for coming. All Take right. Care. Have a good day. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Is uh, Tony there? Yeah, hold on. Let me hit the stop. Okay. Um, okay.